Hi. Oh, Ernest, you are, I was about to call to find out if you are going to join us. Are, are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, we would like to thank the patient participants. Um, <laughs> sorry for the interruption, but I guess we can start. So I'm just going to do a quick introduction to Ernest, and maybe just uh, uh, because this is the, f I think it's the first in the series of what we call our CSC 5741 seminar series, for this year at least. Uh, so the idea behind this seminar series is we, there's a, there's a postgraduate course that's offered in the Department of Computer Science. It's called uh, CSC 5741, Data Mining and Warehousing. And so what we do as part of the course is we invite um, uh, speakers from industry and from academia to come and give talks that are centered around uh, broadly around data mining. Um, and as it turns out, uh, NS is going to be giving the, the, the talk that is centered around uh, radiology. Uh, I'm just going to read out a bio uh, NS here. So NS is uh, Lieutenant Colonel uh, NS Ozuru. Uh, congrats on your uh, promotion, NS. I think he was major the last time he was giving a talk last year. But he's currently, yeah, he's currently um, a postgraduate student in the diagnostic radiology uh, at the Adult and Cancer Diseases Hospital of the University Teaching Hospitals. He was um, he previously worked as a senior resident medical officer at uh, Northern Command Military Hospital in Ndola after completion of his internship at the University Teaching Hospital. So he has uh, quite a quite a, a wealth of experience in this particular area. I should mention here that. Uh, I have a vested interest in what uh, NS does. Um, there, there are a few projects that are in the pipeline, things that we've been discussing for, for, for almost two years now, NS, although we only started working towards them last year. Yeah. Um, so I'm really excited uh, to hear what NS has, to, has to, uh, to offer this year. I will, afterwards, I will share links to the previous talk that he gave. I would like to think this talk is going to be slightly different from the one he gave last year just in case there are people that are going to be interested in um, this aspect of data mining, and specifically this is like uh, tied to image classification uh, or medical imaging as they call it. Um, all right, and so the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, if, if, if you don't mind, maybe you could tell us before you start your talk, your preference on whether you feel comfortable people interrupting you as you're giving the talk or if you prefer for people to ask questions towards the end. Okay. So uh, I'll share my screen. Thank you. Uh, so, as I'm preparing to start the presentation, I just want to apologize for that interruption. Uh, we just had a power cut here, so I had to go in. I had to go into the archives and bring out uh, a, a, a solar backup that I have, and I hope it will be able to sustain us uh, through uh, to the end of this discussion. And um, I would like also to mention, I think that question of whether I would like to be interrupted or questions being withheld until the end, I think everyone is free to ask even as I go through uh, the presentation, uh, if that's fine for everyone else. So I'm trying to get my presentation started here. Um,
Okay, I hope everyone is seeing my screen. Yes, we can see your screen. Uh, okay. I think you want to click the remind me that on that pop up, that, that's why. Oh, okay. Right, so. Yeah, um, and I, I would like to uh, actually extend my, my, my gratitude, I think, again for uh, being invited to give this talk. And uh, like uh, Dr. Piri has mentioned, I think both of us have interest in what each other is doing. I also have interest because of uh, quite a number of issues that I've identified in what I do. And uh, I hope this will allow me at, at some point I'll I would like to uh, join the meeting with the other device that I have so that I can um, show it to the people a glimpse of uh, what I do every day uh, so it can give them an idea of the reasons why I, I, I have interest in what you are also doing. So uh, what we'll do is we'll go through this um, uh, talk uh, according to how I've laid it out there in the outline. And um, um, we'll start with the introduction. I'm sure uh, the invited guests have gone through the, the abstract, which I, I, I gave uh, up front. Then we also discussed the objectives of why really we are making this talk today. We'll discuss what radiology is. I think people would be interested to know what radiology is. It might be or may not be a new terminology to you. I will, I'll try to briefly describe what it is and also show what I do. And then um, uh, I'll talk about the analog radiology and what digitization of radiology is, the factors that influence the digitization of radiology and what are the benefits. And then as a sort of a solution to some of the problems that um, uh, actually leading towards uh, digitization of radiology, we'll talk about the parts and the teleradiology. And then also, after I've done that, we'll have a discussion with the, everybody else who is around and try to identify some solutions that could be uh, brought forward in terms of uh, where there's no the parts as a solution. And then we'll also give concluding remarks. So really, uh, medical imaging or radiology uh, is, is, is a field that has come up and in, in medicine, uh, the development of digital and communication technology has actually influenced the way medicine is practiced today. And there's no area in medicine that has been so much influenced like it has in radiology. So these advances in digital and communication technology have transformed how the old or traditional analog radiology has been practiced into the new digital imaging technology. So new imaging innovations have emerged, including massive, you know, advanced applications in virtually all the subspecialties in radiology, talk of um, nuclear medicine, um, neural radiology, body imaging, uh, chest imaging, uh, mammography for screening of breast cancers. There's a lot happening, including the integration of artificial intelligence and radiomics in, in, in radiology. Uh, the ultimate improvement for all this advancement in you know, technology and medical imaging is the improvement of efficiency of how the radiology department runs, the accuracy of diagnosis that are made, and also you know, the, there's also an improvement in terms of the patient outcome. So there have been several factors that have driven this migration towards digitization of radiology departments. And that is what we are going to focus on. And I will not hesitate to say that even if this uh, migration began as early as uh, the year 1982, we in Zambia, have remained far behind. So there's a really a slow progress towards the digitization of uh, the radiology departments in, in Zambia. So um, for this talk, I'll try to provide awareness of the digital revolution that is taking place in medical imaging. 
And I also tried to bring out some of the factors and which are really the problems that have driven, you know, different institutions to move towards digitization uh, of radiology. And after we have done that, together in the discussion, I think we'll try to identify potential solutions to solve some of the problems that um, our trailing migration to digitization is facing. So who is a radiologist? A radiologist is a medical doctor who is specialized in making diagnosis of medical conditions and also treating those conditions using medical images and medical imaging technology. So what I've tried to show in this slide is a radiologist who is in the center here and he's surrounded by all the different areas from which medical images are generated. In the geology, we call these uh, modalities. So we have images that are, are being generated from mammography, which is the imaging of the breasts, not only for females, but also for males. And um, we also have ultrasound. This is quite common, most people know it. Then we have DEXA, which is for surveillance of the bones. Then we have nuclear medicine, and uh, we have uh, conventional radiography, popularly known as X-rays, and we have fluoroscopy, as well as CT scan and, mammograph and uh, uh, magnetic resonance imaging. These are but a few of the areas from which the medical images are generated um, for diagnosis and treatment. The role of the radiologist is first of all is to create these images, process the images, review the images and interpret the results and issue reports and recommendations as well as go in and manage the patients or treat the patients where it is uh, necessary. So really a, a radiologist has a lot of tasks to do and for you to become a radiologist, you need to be a doctor first to understand the diseases and the pathologies that are involved in the different diseases. When you become, to, you come to pursue a training in radiology, then you begin to build upon that knowledge to correlate the clinical findings of the doctors and the changes that are seen in the medical images that you are seeing for that patient. So there's a lot that is done in, in radiology. And traditionally, from the time that radiology was born, I think I mentioned this uh, in the last talk that I gave last year for those that might have been available. Uh, radiology would say was born in about 1895 in Germany with the discovery of X-rays. Uh, but over time, over the years, so many uh, modalities have come on board uh, in the imaging of the patients for the purposes of diagnosis and treatment. So at its inception, radiology was analog, meaning that it was not digital. And so the process would involve, like what I'm trying to show here, with, it would begin with, uh, you know, an X-ray film being inserted into one of these. These are called X-ray cassettes. So you place an X-ray film into that cassette. This cassette is taken to the imaging room. By the way, the cassette cannot be opened where there is light. So there's a place in every radiology department called the dark room, uh, where the person who works there is totally in the dark. The X-ray films are not supposed to be exposed to uh, sunlight uh, or any other sort of light uh, or else they'll get spoiled. So they work blindly to insert the film into the cassette. Then the cassette is taken to the X-ray machine, inserted into the machine and the image is taken. Like you would expose uh, someone you are taking a photo of. Then this cassette is trans uh, transported to develop the image. This uh, image here is that of an old developer, film developer that was used way back 
and it has like uh, systems, three systems with different chemicals. And the operator would actually insert that um, X-ray film um, in these chemicals to develop uh, the image and then place it somewhere to dry. And then what would come out is the X-ray film as we see it uh, often uh, in our clinics. Um, there is a relatively newer kind of the developer, which is kind of automated, which is this one available at uh, University Chief Hospital, which uh, you only feed um, the film into the machine. It will pass that film by itself in all the three chemicals that are used to develop uh, the film. The films, once developed and dried, are then brought to the radiographer to actually review and interpret uh, the image. So the radiologist will sit at the X-ray viewing box, also called the light box, and look at um, the image and identify the problems uh, that are in the image. So um, this is what used to happen in the olden days. Nowadays, the situation is slightly uh, different. We are trying to go digital, but the process has really not been that smooth. So, um, sorry, let me get to the next slide. Okay, uh, sorry about that. Um, yeah. So those have been the problems um, of trying to maneuver with those processes from the beginning to the end. Um, so what is digitization of radiology? What is a digitized radiology? So in a nutshell, a digitized radiology is a computerized imaging department, medical imaging uh, department, that consists of the radiology information system, the picture archiving and communication system, which is also encompassed by the whole of the hospital, known as the hospital information system. And, uh, you know, these are electronic storage of records for the patients into which even the medical imaging is now being uh, incorporated. So the idea is that this approach, <clears throat> excuse me, tends to lead to a, what is called a filmless healthcare system. So a film-based healthcare system is where you see, I think most of us have met uh, patients several times walking around in the hospital or even on the bus <clears throat> on their way to the hospital carrying a large envelope, usually colored pink, uh, where they are keeping their x-rays. Now, uh, digitized radiology is an approach where you have a filmless healthcare system. In that case, you do not have uh, physical films for the medical images for a patient, for every study that the patient uh, is given. As I mentioned, the digitization process began in about 1982 in Europe and the West, uh, but in Africa and Zambia, uh, we are still trailing behind uh, with this uh, kind of technology. So there are several factors that actually drove the need to digitize uh, the radiology departments. Uh, first of all, it was the issue of the workload. Uh, you will notice that uh, there is an exploding, uh, you know, growth in the catchment population of the hospitals. The rate at which the populations in the world are growing is quite fast, but this is against uh, what you would say a static number of radiologists. So the workload is increasing. The other thing is about uh, the multiplicity, about the multiplicity of um, um, the multiplicity of the modalities more and more applications are being applied in medicine in terms of imaging 
So there's more work actually at the table for the radiologist. And we also have this factor that, you know, the, the medical images um, can really be acquired at a very fast rate. The machines that are able to generate these images today are ultra fast. And so there are more images that are being, you know, conducted, for example, in a day, increasing upon the workload uh, for the radiologist. And then there's also this increasing dependence on the imaging for diagnosis. Um, it's a general trend that has been observed that clinicians or physicians, you know, in the outpatient departments, in the emergency units, the doctors in the front line are increasingly depending on imaging for them to make diagnosis of uh, different ailments that the patients are presenting with. And so this has actually also led to an increased workload for the radiologist who are already very few in numbers. So the next factor is that of the workflow. So there is this tedious imaging process. There's you no know, repeated manual paperwork, you know, where a patient, for example, when they come, have to have their you know details captured from the request form which they come with. Uh, into the different, uh, you know, uh, books, uh, tally books that are used in the radiology department. And these have to be paperwork capture or details has to be done repeatedly at different steps. And then you have these machines that take long to image the patient. And it takes also long to process uh, the images until they reach you know, the radiologist who should review those images and interpret the problems who also has a lot of workload and few in numbers. So the workflow is also um, one of the factors that uh, uh, help to drive this uh, need towards uh, digitization of uh, the processes. And analog, uh, analog imaging you know, processes are prone to a lot of repeats and rejects. So you could do a chest X-ray, for example, and it goes through all the processes uh, that are done until it reaches the radiologist. And when at that point, when the radiologist is supposed to review the images and write a report, it so happens that the technical factors are not quite right. The image was not done correctly. So you have to request for a repeat. That not only delays uh, the production of the reports, okay, and delaying the treatment for the patient, but it also costs a lot, you know, the, consumer, the consumables are wasted. And also there's uh, the other issue of increased radiation exposure to the patient. And in many cases, it's not uncommon, especially at our institution in UTH, that um, there is, you know, loss, a lot of loss of um, uh, images that have already been conducted. So really, uh, we are going into this area of digitization because of such processes. The next uh, factor is that of uh, storage. So if you are using the analog type of uh, imaging, you realize that you need to have um, a physical space where you store these images because they still remain properties of the hospital. And by law, medical images that are taken for a patient are supposed to be kept safe for five to 10 years so that they can always be referred to if there is need in the future. And certain special examinations require that they should be uh, kept for longer periods of time, even up to 20 years. For example, uh, miners, those who are exposed to the silicon underground in the mines, you have to keep their chest x-rays for up to 20 years because they may develop lung problems and you know it becomes a medical legal issue where they have to be compensated so there's an um the issue the requirement of storage and with this kind of storage you know there are issues to do with the retrieval of odd imaging uh, modalities if a patient is an image today and Two years down the line, the patient comes back and you have to repeat the examination. 
you want to refer back to what you had done two years before to see whether there's an improvement or whether there's a deterioration or whether the disease process has remained static. So here we see uh, what I've given there in the, in the, in the images that are on this slide is that so this is what we are using at UTH for storage, for example. These are the films because we are still alongside the digital, we're also using analog uh, imaging systems. So we see that you need to have a physical space where to place these um, films for the patients. And you can imagine if you had 100,000, you know, uh, such films, and you wanted to retrieve a film for Dr. Zulu, for example, it would be a very, very hectic process to do. So we are slowly moving on, uh, moving on, uh, migrating from this type of storage, because now we are beginning to digitize the department. We moved on to the CDs, which are equally not good enough. Uh, for example, you can have, say, five different patients who have been imaged, and the images have been backed up on a CD. So you have to, first of all, identify where that CD is, and then open that CD for you to access the images for a particular patient who has come the second time around. So um, I'll quick, be quick also to say that Again, we are trying to move away from this kind of uh, storage of images to this kind, and this is a hard drive. So now, at this point at UTH, we are backing up our images uh, on a hard drive, which unfortunately also runs a lot of risks because it could crash. Excuse me just for a while. Is everyone with me? Yes, still here. Yes. Okay, sorry, my apologies for that. Yeah, so <clears throat> this is at the point where we are, where now we are saving our images uh, on a hard drive. This hard drive could get lost. This hard drive could crash. And unfortunately, um, the technical know-how is not that good on how these images are, are being stored because they are being uh, stored not with a key identifier. So it is quite, quite difficult to retrieve images uh, for cross-reference. So um, the next um, uh, point to we'll go to is uh, that of um, okay. Um, I'm trying to get to the next slide. Yeah, uh, report uh, turnaround time. So it is of the patient's interest that when you image the patient, it's only ethical that they should get that report in good time so that it can guide the doctors on the way forward in terms of treatment for the patient. Um, so long report turnaround times, you know, come out of a combination of what we have already talked about, heavy workload for the radiologist, uh, long imaging and processing times, as well as reading times for the examinations, a few uh, radiologists that we have, repeat examinations, all of these are factors that actually contribute to long report turnaround times. And then, you know, what I've given there as typical turnaround times are what we see, for example, at uh, 
um, at the university chief hospitals. Um, it's actually, uh, you know, shameful to even talk about that uh, even emergency um, reports will take hours to even three days or sometimes up to even a week before um, a report is given to the patient. Um, so the times that I've given here are kind of anecdotal. They are not really based on the research that we've conducted, but based on the experience that I have, um, I have had uh, working in that department for the past two years. So you see that routine examinations, for example, a chest X-ray, simple chest X-ray, will take days to even a week. Uh, the patient keeps on chasing for a report. And then, you know, uh, non-emergency CT scan and MRI can actually take months. Some of them can actually end up never being reported and they are backloaded into the uh, library. Um, you know, mammography screening, you know, October is a, is a month where we call upon all the women above the age of 19, you know, to start uh, screening. Um, so we do a lot of imaging for, uh, for breast to screen for, um, you know, signs of breast cancer. And most of them end up not being reported, you know, because of, uh, you know, the factors that we talked about. So um, we, in the, in the imaging departments, we are trying now to see whether um, uh, we can uh, improve and how can we improve is to actually try and digitize the department so that the processes uh, can, be, uh, can be easier uh, to get through. Just for that, I'm trying to see how best I can be navigating through the slides. Oh, okay, yeah, sorry. Maybe try yeah. press F5. F5? Yes. Okay. Um, for those who are doing computer, uh, I mean, the majority of the audience <laughs> will know that we are used to uh, Windows, and this is Linux. I'm using it for the first time. My apologies for that. Um, so. Or alternatively, maybe you can yeah. just go on slideshow and then you begin okay. from the current slide. From the current slide. Yes, go on the slideshow on the top ribbon. Uh -huh. Okay, so it seems to be deactivated. Yeah. It's not working. And no. Oh, so then maybe just click on one of the slides and just press down or up key. For this. It should be able to move to the next one, maybe. Okay. Just click the side by one of the slides. Is it seven or eight? And then try and move the down arrow key. Okay. No. So if you, to your left, you just click one of them, click on seven, and then- On seven? Yeah, and then try and move the down arrow key. Nothing? Uh, no, it's not. Okay. Uh, then you just have to move the scroller, that orange button. Yeah, this one. Yeah. It appears that maybe you you run out of slides. Okay. It's like it's ending on slide six. No, I can actually see it uh, going forward. Um, 
going all the way to the end, that which is the 24th slide. So, so alternative when always fails, just uh, close it and reopen it again. Maybe, okay. uh, I don't know if it's near Android, perhaps that has something to do with it. I think we're there though. We're going through the slides, I can see them. Yeah, 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 we are going through the slides. Um, only challenge is um, um, okay. it's not so easy for me to go to the next slide. Uh, okay, so let me see if I can try the slideshow again. Yeah, so all of them are deactivated. But, uh, if I Okay. So we we're talking about um, a re long reporting around times and we've described uh, the factors that are associated with that and the ima typical imaging times that we see, for example, at UTH. Um, the next factor I would like to talk about is that of um, a few trained radiologists. Again, you know, I, I, I could not find the WHO recommended, recommended uh, radiologist to patient ratio, um, but um, probably it suffices to mention that in the, United, in, the, in, the, in the European Union, for example, countries that belong to the EU, the average number of radiologists is 12.7, the 100,000 population. If we were to go by this standard, um, our population is about 18 million now, but we've not had the census. But even if we took uh, the published uh, population for Zambia, which was, I think the last was in 2010, uh, the population was um, 18 million plus. You would see that you would need in Zambia probably more than 190 radiologists. Okay. Um, but Currently in Zambia, we have only eight radiologists that are working in the public sector. And, um, you know, the American uh, College of Radiologists in 2003 said that, you know, the imaging utilization is increasing, you know, like uh, the request for CT scans, uh, ultrasound, MRI, all these modalities, they're increasing at a very fast rate of 6% each year. There's an increase in the request. Meanwhile, the number of radiologists is actually increasing at only 2% per year. So there's that discrepancy in terms of the rate at which the images are being generated and the rate at which uh, radiologists are coming up, which uh, tends to leave, you know, this shortage of radiologists, uh, you know, perpetual. And there is another stat that has been done to show, which shows that in fact, most of the radiologists that are, are, are there now are already aging in terms of, you know, they are, they are, age, they are, they are aged. And we may see a, a serious crisis in the near future where most of them may either die or retire completely from, uh, from service. So these are, the, uh, uh, are some of the factors, again, that, you know, have helped to drive this uh, move towards um, um, digitization. Um, the other thing is that of um, new trains. Uh, so because, uh, you know, um, our colleagues in, in Europe and in the West have, you know, really digitized their departments and we depend on them in terms of uh, purchasing of equipment, we see that uh, analog machines are increasingly becoming less and less available on the market. So any department that is trying to set up or that is trying to change the machines have no choice but to buy machines that are compatible with the digital imaging. So this is one other influence uh, that is leading towards uh, digitization. There is need that all the machines should be compatible 
and be in compliance to a standard, you know, format in which medical images are stored and transmitted called DICOM, which means digital image and communication in medicine. There's also a need for the all, it's actually a requirement. It's a regulated, a regulatory, you know, measure and by law that um, um, the imaging departments should have almost zero leakage of radiation so that there's no exposure to uh, workers and no unnecessary exposure to patients as well as in the public. Here in Zambia, we do have an authority that is looking into that, the Radiation Protection Authority. Uh, they are situated, uh, situated uh, fiscally near uh, Ridgeway campus in, in, in lawmakers or in Ridgeway. And then there's also this integration of uh, artificial intelligence for disease pattern recognition. So all these trends, uh, new trends that are coming uh, that are coming onto the market are actually driving um, the regulatory departments towards uh, uh, digital processes. Then, so we also have the cost as a factor, the running cost for consumables and maintenance. Uh, if you remember when I discussed about analog uh, imaging, I will give an example of how long the process is to produce an X-ray film from inserting the film into the cassette all the way up to the point when the radiologist uh, looks at uh, the image. A lot of you know, processes and steps are involved the chemicals that are used to develop uh, the images have to be replaced every so often. So there's a lot of costs, and because there are a lot of uh, repeats and images, we see that um, the cost tends to be high. In a digital way, that X-ray will actually be taken once. If the radiologist is not happy with the technical aspect of the image, post-processing is possible. You can manipulate the image for it to give you the picture that you would like to see. And also the cost on human resource. You need to have a person who is working in the dark room. You need to have a person who is working in the imaging room who actually does the actual imaging. And you need to have a person who is the clerk working, capturing, you know, um, uh, the paperwork, and you need to have a radiologist to be involved. So there are a lot of uh, uh, costs that are involved with the analog uh, imaging system, which is uh, the reason why there's this need to move to uh, um, the digital imaging. So what I've given above as factors that have influenced the migration towards a digitized system, um, kind of global, but also a few that are quite unique to our situation. So we have the picture archiving and communication system. This system was conceived as a solution to the many problems that we've looked at. There are two types of parts, um, the on-premise and the cloud-based. But these are new like digital systems that are being employed in the uh, radiology department as a solution to these many problems that we talked about. And as I mentioned uh, in the beginning, that the PAC system goes together with the radiology information system and the hospital information system. And these three have to work together in such a manner that once the patient comes into the hospital, they are given, they are given a unique identifier, for example, a patient number, they can actually, once entered into the system, the details of this patient should be made available to the radiology department. And the radiology information systems can then, if requested, use the details of the patient to schedule for the examination that has been requested and capture the necessary information that is required, such as the age of the patient, you know, the occupation, what they do, and um, the reason why the patient has to do that examination which is being requested, and the preliminary investigation or the preliminary 
a diagnosis for the, uh, from the physician who has initially seen the patient. Then the PACs come in to image the patient, and now we are talking about the components of the, the PACs. There is image acquisition, the image and patient information transmission, and then you have the workstation, which are used uh, for image review and interpretation, as well as to write a report based on the findings from the images. And also, most important, the archives where these images can be stored. Images and rep reports can easily be stored and easily be retrieved for the purposes of cross-reference and for future uh, reviews. So um, this is uh, like what comes as a solution. I think the main solution that um, has been you know, employed in the West in terms of trying to uh, come up with the solutions um, to the problems. And here I just gave a few, just these two images to show uh, the connectivity of uh, a cloud packs. Um, the on-premise packs is where you have a server that is located at the department which uh, stores all the imaging modalities and they are packaged in such a way that if a patient has done ultrasound, x-ray, uh, CT scan, uh, mammography, they can all be linked to one patient and not be kept as isolated examinations. So we have the imaging component. This shows like a CT scan where the imaging is done and then uh, will be taken to a server and then from the server this information can be assessed in, accessed in the hospital and the radiologist can review and interpret these images can also be sent to the cloud can be transmitted so that they are available to other users who are permitted uh, to view those images okay and then uh, there are advantages uh, to do with the packs i mean mainly as i said is to answer the problems that we've spoken about fast and automated image acquisitions, the ability to display different types of images on the same screen, ultrasound, fluoroscopy, uh, mammography, all of them are compatible. And then you have this ability to post-process the images. After the images have been acquired, you can still alter the images uh, to depict certain um, areas of interest in that image. And then uh, because of uh, these new machines that are being used, there's reduced radiation exposure. We know that radiation is detrimental to the health of individuals. So you want to reduce the levels of radiation um, given to the patient to as low as reasonably you know, uh, achievable. And then also to reduce the leakages to the staff as well as the members of the public. And then also to reduce on the time that it takes to retrieve all the images and also you know um, in in a digital a digitally stored image will not be distorted with time you can review it five years ten years down the line it still looks the same um, unlike the analog types where uh, you know the film once exposed to light over a period of time uh, the image may fade, you know, and uh, it may stick to the envelope, and a lot of things may happen, okay? So the PAC system also reduces on loss of images, and then you can, you know, reproduce the same image in uh, multiple copies if you lose uh, the hard copy that you have. And then um, there's also that increase in speed and quality of the reporting, and then the turnaround time for you know, course is reduced. These images can be transmitted um, far and wide across continents in real time, almost real time, and uh, they can be accessed by uh, people of interest. And then there is this breakdown in the physical, you know, time and physical barrier associated with the traditional film-based images. And it also has the ability to digitize old films so that they can be kept in the archives longer. It is reliable, and I don't know whether I should really say that cost-effective because 
well, we have failed to have this, uh, you know, tax system for the past, I don't know how many, 30, 40 years now, down the line from the time it was launched. And really there is that ease of use uh, of, uh, of the tax system. Here is an example of the cloud parks that uh, we are exposed to here in Zambia. Fortunately enough, I think we have also been given a, um, the ability to uh, uh, be given permission. This uh, Bainsnet is based in Zimbabwe. It's a private entity, so they use uh, cloud parks and uh, a number of um, uh, imaging modalities here in Zambia have been linked to these uh, parks in Zimbabwe, Cancer Disease Hospital um, here in Zambia, UTH, uh, Radiology Department, CT is connected, uh, CT in Chipata, uh, CT in Livingstone, they are connected uh, to this. So they are able to upload uh, um, images for patients on this platform. And we have the ability to actually log in and um, and uh, view the images, read the images, and uh, write reports. So you can see that you can do a lot uh, when it comes to parts. Everything is in one place. So I can view the worklist, I can view the reports, the studies, uh, and virtually everything that you want to do is available uh, on the parts platform. So, um, we are talking about the new trades. Um, I've decided to bring this out uh, because I think it's one of uh, the milestones in the history of uh, medical imaging in Zambia at Minasoko Medical Center. It has changed from Minasoko Medical Hospital now called Minasoko Medical Center. We have the first PAX implementation in a public institution here in Zambia. Though not fully rolled out yet, uh, but um, it is available and um, it is the on-premise type uh, where the server is based at the institution and the number of modalities have been linked. So you, could ha uh, you have the CT scan, MRI, ultrasound, the X-ray, fluoroscopy and mammography are all going to be linked to, to this PAX system. For example, here I've shown that um, the MRI scanner, the CT scanner are all you know, linked to the server, are linked to the server which uh, stores the images and they can be as accessed at the workstation. All these modalities can be accessed at the, at the workstation. Um, Another, you know, sort of solution to the problem, especially of that of few radiologists uh, that has been developed over time is uh, the issue of teleradiology. Teleradiology is uh, simply the remote electronic transmission of radiographic images from one geographical location to another. And this is just for the purpose of image interpretation and consultation in cases where you don't have the radiologist. So uh, um, this platform is where, for example, you could have um, a patient who is imaged in Livingstone where there's no radiologist. And if you have the facility, you can actually transmit those images to UTH and the radiologist at UTH can have a look at those images in real time and uh, discuss the findings you know, in real time with the, uh, the uh, referring physician from Livingstone and uh, come up with a diagnosis. And you would have actually helped uh, the doctors in Livingstone as well as the patient in Livingstone. This is being implemented at UTH, uh, supported by World Bank. So what I've shown here in the picture is uh, the screen that is going to be used uh, for tele teleradiology. I'm not very sure yet which uh, provinces will be linked to uh, because they are still in the installation process and we have not yet been uh, uh, oriented to it. Um, UTH itself, the adult hospital and the cancer disease hospital, 
have quite a number of uh, uh, machines, medical imaging machines, all of which are digital and are compatible with PAX and DICO. Unfortunately, up to this day, they are still working in isolation. We have the X-ray, uh, the CT scan, ultrasound, we have nuclear medicine, MRI, we have, uh, this is a cat lab which is used for treatment and many other, you know, modalities that are present or which are, are digital and yet they still work in isolation because there's no PAX system, there's no system to bring these machines together. And <clears throat> so what is done is that each time you image a patient, you save the images on a CD. The CD has to physically be taken to the reporting room and the radiologist has to take a look at the images. A lot of things can happen. The CD has failed to burn. The CD has been scratched because the patient didn't know how to handle it and you are unable to open and view. After you have read, you throw it into the library. It is difficult to find it again in the future. So the problems that we've already talked about still exist even when we have these machines that are digital and compatible uh, for a digitized uh, uh, radiology department. Um, so what can we do when there's no packs? I thought that maybe this is a point where we can have a discussion uh, based on what our you know, uh, <coughs> specialists that are in this room have gotten through what we do. Maybe they could throw in points here and there to try and see how we can solve or bridge the gap between analog and digitized uh, radiology at UTH, for example. What we need is an efficient way of processing the images, storing the images, retrieving the images for future references in the absence of the picture archiving and uh, communication systems. So at this point, I will allow anyone to, to come in and ask questions, for example, or give comments on uh, uh, what I have delivered so far. All right, uh, Ernest, I mean, thank you very much. I, mean, I, I never, uh, I can never get used to, to your talks. I mean, this is a second time I'm listening to you give a formal presentation and 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 we we've incidentally Ernest and I have been chatting about these these things almost on a weekly basis. So we meet and we brainstorm about a number of things here. But I just wanted to remind people as people think about questions here that, that there's there's quite quite a bit that has been talked about here, right? Uh, in as much as 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 you know the talks are uh, ideally supposed to be aligned towards uh, CSC 5741, but if you are paying attention you will realize that there's a broad spectrum of computing subfields that have been implicitly uh, discussed by NS, right? Ranging from uh, automated workflows, for instance, you know, a long-term preservation of these important uh, digital images, right? Um, image retrieval, you know, so, so there's, there's quite a bit here that can be done. And I'm explicitly mentioning some of these things because it turns out that uh, uh, there are people in the room, final year students that I'm working with, that are fundamentally working towards uh, implementing repository software tools. Uh, I just wanted to remind them that in as much as the type of data that would be housed by a repository system will be specific to the PACS workflow will be different from what you're working towards, but the principle is the same, right? Long-term preservation of data facilitating easy access to data, right, through browsing and searching. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, the, the floor is open. Um, I won't uh, say a lot here, I'm sure. We, we have a number of experts here, especially our colleagues that I know into CSC 5741, I, and I know that they have a number of uh, brilliant uh, things to say about NS presentation. So please, the floor is open, no need to raise up your hand. If you have a question, just uh, unmute yourself and uh, speak away, thank you. Yeah, and so and as we wait for the questions or comments, contributions, uh, I think you have seen in that slide here, I've put that second bullet, image repository. And 
I think, you know, as a radiologist, um, I do not have the technical know-how, which probably I should have, <laughs> but not as yet. And I put there the image repository thinking that this could be the way forward for us because I think the issue of storage and access to previous images is, is really a big issue and uh, quite a, a drawback because in any disease condition, any disease pattern you would want to see, is there improvement in this patient? Especially patients that have been imaged and uh, uh, there has been, you know, uh, some form of treatment as has, has been instituted, you would want to see over time, is there improvement or not? And you need to have a reference point. If you don't have a reference point, it's very difficult to actually tell whether the treatment is working or not. I agree. And, and I mean, I mean, there, there are some examples that you said. I should mention here that uh, I've, I've been studying so-called uh, you know, repository software tools since 2011, so for almost a decade now. The, the important points that you raise, like when you get the example of, uh, uh, you know, uh, information to do with, uh, is it, or ima Im images associated with minors, for instance, so things that you'd want to refer to years down the line, right? This is why you'd need uh, image repositories. And, and I think something that, I, I don't know if we do this at, at, at UTH, you know, trying to identify historical patterns that might exist in data, right? For you to be able to do that, um, you need data to be stored in a certain way. Yeah. Uh, and tied to some of the things we've been talking about in CSC 5741 here, we, we, we introduced this notion that uh, the key ingredient to what we're discussing in the course is, is data, right? For you to get to a stage where you're identifying a data source, obviously you need to be certain that the information you're extracting from that source is reliable, right? Mm. So qu quite a number of steps involved here before you can get to a stage where you start extracting patterns from the data essentially. So I, I don't know if people have any thoughts or suggestions about some of these things here. You know, uh, I know some things may, may be considered trivial, like when you saw those images of how they store records, right? It's almost like you're in the <laughs> 90s here, but I don't know if people have thoughts about that. Yeah. 